However, in other cases, they are more aggressive in actually controlling parts of the state. An example is to attack political candidates. The contenders are not even in office, so have not had the opportunity to hurt cartels' business. But gangsters want to make sure the politicians are already in their pocket and hit those who refuse to make a deal or side with rivals. Of numerous attacks on candidates, the most high profile was on Rodolfo Torre, who ran for governor of Tamalipa State in 2010. The physician, running on a Brit ticket, was predicted to win the race with a landslide margin of more than 30 points. But a week before the vote, gunmen showered his campaign convoy with rifle fire, killing him and four aides. The ability to choose whether electoral frontrunners live sends an ominous message to politicians about the power of el narco. But what prize is el narco fighting for? If gangsters simply want the right to smuggle drugs, observers argue, it doesn't pose such a destructive insurgent threat to society. However, as the Mexican drug war has escalated, Gangsters have got increase, increasingly ambitious. Certain cartels now extort every business in sight. Moreover, they have muscled into industries traditionally shaken down by the Mexican government. The Zetas dominate the east of Mexico, where the oil industry is strongest. They tax as much as they can from it, both by extorting the union and stealing gas to sell off as com contraband. Over in Michoacán, La Familia shakes down both the mining industry and illegal log logging, both assets the government used to benefit from. Such activities vary from gang to gang. The Sinaloa cartel is largely limited to the traditional traffic of drugs. Meanwhile, the criminal groups that have branched out most are the very same that attack federal forces hardest. When gangs can tax industry, there is a serious weakening of the state. Where cartels are strongest, their power seeps from politics into the private sector and media. In Juarez, business leaders argued that if they have to pay protection money to the mafia, they shouldn't have to cough up taxes to the federal government. It was a telling argument. The city's main newspaper, El Diario de Juarez, made the point even harder following the mafia murder of a 21-year-old photographer on his lunch break. In a front-page editorial entitled, What Do You Want From Us?, El Diario addressed the cartels directly and touched nerves in the Calderon government. You are at this time the de facto authorities in this city because the legal authorities have not been able to stop our colleagues from falling, despite the fact that we've repeatedly demanded it from them. Even war has rules. In any outbreak of violence, protocols or guarantees exist for the groups in conflict in order to safeguard the integrity of the journalists who cover it. That is why we reiterate, gentlemen of the various narco-trafficking organizations, that you explain what it is that you want from us so we don't have to pay tribute with the lives of our colleagues. And that is from El Narco by Joan Grillo. This is Melissa Ford Malonado, and we are in hard country. Welcome to the hard country. My name is Joshua Trevino at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I'm joined by my colleague, Melissa Ford Maldonado. Melissa, a fantastic piece from uh, Joan Grillo's new book, actually, El Narco. How, how's the book at large? It's so good, Josh. It's like a very gripping tale that basically, like it not only paints a portrait of what cartels have been in history, but it paints a portrait of how they have radically emerged into the criminal insurgency that they are right now. And I find it very fascinating because he interviews so many people in this book. And we've talked about Johan Grillo's work multiple times. Uh, we get his newsletters. We, we actually talked about it last podcast mm -hmm. when we were talking about how bad crime has gotten in Mexico. But I think it's very interesting because he not only aims to paint this picture of narcos, but to answer why is it that they've gotten so powerful? Is it because Americans can't stop taking drugs? Or is it because the narcos have basically taken a big chunk of Mexico's sovereignty and are threatening their democracy? And yeah. so I found it fascinating. As I was telling you, I had the hardest time deciding what to read. I had like five or five, four or five options, um, but I would definitely recommend it. There's a lot of firsthand stories, firsthand tales, absolutely fascinating. 
And, and, and of course, there's a third option in there, which is that the Mexican state itself has made a positive decision to cooperate with its own criminal cartels, which is something you and I have talked about yeah. quite a bit. Uh, you know, Gr Grillo, Juan Grillo, um, uh, unusual name. I'll spell it for, for those who are uh, listening because I, I wouldn't know. It's uh, I-O-A-N, and then the last name is a G R I L L O. But uh, Grillo, uh, it's not Grillo, it's Grillo, um, is, is one of a small number of, uh, to, to, to my mind, very incisive analysts of what's happening mm -hmm. in Mexico. It's him. Falco Ernst, David Agren, yep. uh, the late Alejandro Hope um, uh, was one of them. Uh, so, so these are the people that you end up having to find to get really good news and analysis coming out of Mexico. Uh, you know, and, and it's a fairly new book, right? I don't. I'm not sure actually how new it is. It's new to me. It's That's new why to you. I okay. called it my no, new book. <laughs> this is totally fine. Well, certainly within the past uh, within the past decade. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so. Well, I, I actually wanted to use that passage to segue into asking you about something that you just did last week. Sure. I think yeah. it was exactly a week ago. But on Wednesday, you testified in front of the House Cartel Task Force. So, can you tell us a little bit about what you told them? Yes. Uh, uh, thanks for the segue. Um, uh, it was it was a privilege to be invited to testify before the um, the it's the I think it's the U.S. House of Representatives Task Force on mm -hmm. Mexican Drug Cartels is the formal name, which we'll call the Cartel Task Force for the purpose yeah. of this conversation. Uh, but they've been bringing in a lot of individuals, subject matter experts, uh, you know, people with, with with good insight on what's happening in Mexico to come in and inform the task force members. And it is a genuinely bipartisan group um, on what's happening with the cartels. Uh, and and what's interesting to me is is there's a real desire, at least um, you know, was explained to me and what I perceived when I was there testifying, to really understand kind of the roots of what's happening uh, in Mexico with the cartels. And so and so I thought the 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 questions. That I received were um, were actually very thoughtful from both sides, from both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, you know, we talked about a, a variety of. Uh, issues including uh, Mexican nationalism, Mexican foreign relations, the nature of um, uh, taxation of remittances, for example, which is a subject a subject that I personally flip flopped on uh, in the past uh, several weeks. I'm now in favor of it. Or, or, or I really wasn't before. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, you know, DC and the Congress uh, get a bad rap, uh, mostly deserved for having essentially substance free conversations. But I have to say that anybody who um, has lost faith in the power of deliberative democracy. Um, you know, should have been in that room uh, in which a, a, a spectrum of individuals of varying views uh, actually had a real conversation about what to do. And, uh, you know, they were very gracious in listening to, to our prescriptions. You know, we, we advanced essentially three major propositions. One, that the, that the Mexican state uh, is not a friend of the United States, um, uh, which we distinguish very clearly from ordinary Mexicans. The second proposition that we advance is that the state and the cartels exist in conscious synthesis with one another, um, kind of to the point from the Grillo piece you were reading. And then, and then the third thing that we advance is that as a consequence of the first two items, uh, American policy toward Mexico has to be based upon uh, essentially a transactional relationship backed by American hard power. And we had a series of policy recommendations that we made from this, including expanding the Engel list, a lot of stuff that we've talked about on the show before, expanding right. the Engel list to include Mexican nationals. Right. Um, Foreign terror organization designation for Mexican cartels, uh, and uh, and so on. And 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 I would say the the, the number one thing uh, that we that we proposed is that there is a linkage between Mexican trade and security. That for all the wealth and all the prosperity that comes from trade with the United States. There has to be something more than simply than simply the trade for its own sake. That if Mexico fails to deliver security on its end, uh, then uh, they won't enjoy the benefits of trade. A major mistake, by the way, that was made kind of in what I would describe as the neoliberal era of the 1990s and beyond, when there was this belief that you could have trade for its own sake and it would have this array of ancillary benefits. You know, the the example of the People's Republic of China being the signal failure in that res regard. You know, great trade with China actually only ended up empowering. Um, you know, probably the sole existential enemy of the United States right now, which is the PRC under Communist Party rule. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we made the same bet with the Mexican state. It hasn't paid off. So it's time for some linkage in that regard. Um, so we're very, uh, very privileged to talk to the task force and yeah. um, looking forward to whatever final report they generate. Right. Well, thanks yeah. for sharing. Hopefully we'll be able to post your testimony out there soon for the, everybody the, to read. The testimony uh, the testimony is posted at TexasPolicy.com. So for those of you oh, who uh, are, are watching this online, uh, it's out there. Or just uh, go to thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll provide a, a link in the show description. Well, since we're on the topic of cartels or what we call or what Yoan Grillo calls el narco, which el is narco. like this like vast, oh, yes. like global faceless criminal network, right? That's like casting its murderous shadow over Mexico. I wanted to ask you about a prop that you brought here today. 
Yes, uh, uh, m more than a prop, I guess. Uh, I'll, I'll have to. Um, so for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, you can see what I'm holding up. It's a ball cap with the initials JGL on it. Uh, for those of you who are listening as a podcast, I'll have to describe it. Um, um, it's it's sort of like an audio description in uh, in, the, in these movies that you can yeah. get now. My, my, my oldest son is is uh, visually impaired, so I'm, I'm used to the audio description. Josh is holding a ball cap that happens to be blue with a white backing on it. Uh, but in fact, I am. Uh, this ball cap uh, that I have, and it's one of these kind of flat brimmed snapback caps, which are um, uh, abhorrent uh, to those of us of a certain age, uh, but are very <laughs> popular among the youth now. Uh, it, it, it has, uh, uh, just to describe it to you, it's got a, a Mexican flag on it, and emblazoned on the Mexican flag are the initials JGL, and underneath is, is the name that it stands for. It's Joaquin Guzman Lera, uh, which uh, the alert listener will know exactly who that is. Mm. Who is Joaquin Guzman Lera? El Chapo. It's El Chapo. It's El Chapo. This is El Chapo merch, which you can get. I'll tell you the store I got it at, Texas Boot Ranch Store number two in Northwest San Antonio. It's a nice part of town. It's near the Hyatt Hill Country Resort. Um, uh, this is not this is not something that was purchased in in a uh, in, in in a dusty marketplace with knockoff goods. This is real branded El Chapo gear, and there's a lot of it out there. I've since gone and looked online and found it. But you know, I walked into this boot store uh, candidly. I'll just give you the backstory because I needed boots, uh, and so I still need. You boots. just happened upon it. I just happened upon it. I looked up where a boot store was nearby. And I uh, was in San Antonio for work, and uh, and then and then went to Texas Boot Ranch store number two and walked in, and I was absolutely astonished. Um, uh, actually, there were some good boots there, but uh, most of them were um, uh, what uh, sort of these fancy boots that are very popular among Norteño circles, botas exoticas. Uh, I remember they had they had this the, the, this rack of of boots that were. Um, it looked like calfskin leather, but the but the shoe of the boot was dyed electric green, and then like the sleeve of the boot uh, was was a uh, black and white, um, uh, not just cow hide, but the actual cow hair. So 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 boots that you just wouldn't see anywhere else. All from I think um, uh, like Leon and Guanajuato. So all from there, there was obviously Mexican distributors, but the major role of of, of the store uh, was to peddle cartel branded merch, and so uh, and so of course they had a bunch of. El Chapo branded gear, uh, which uh, again I'll hold up for the camera here. Uh, I'm not going to put it on because I wouldn't be caught dead uh, wearing this. Or if I did wear this, I might I might become dead. Um, but they've got El Chapo gear, and then and then the boots themselves. And this is where you have to be alert to a lot of the symbology of it. Uh, lots of them, um, for the best sellers for all I know, but certainly the ones in the prominent uh, places in the store had a, a yellow rooster um, uh, emblazoned on the front of the boots. And so the yellow rooster is is. Um, is a symbol of the Sinaloa cartel. So essentially what this was, was El Chapo and Sinaloa cartel branded gear being sold. That is insane. It is absolutely insane. And it was it was the it was the primary thematic thrust of, of Texas Boot Ranch store number two, which was to sell this particular gear. Now, as I mentioned, I've gone and looked online, and apparently there's a lot of this. Like, if you can go online and get uh, get El Chapo branded gear everywhere. I guess somebody has licensed it, or they're doing it on their own. Although, you know, God help them if if the actual um, named individual decides to uh, get his royalties from his residuals. But uh, you know, you know, the, the the fact that this is out there, the fact that there is a store that does business with with with, with narco cartel branded gear, the same cartels that are killing, uh, you know, a Vietnam's worth of Americans, uh, you know, plus uh, every you know x number of months, is is absolutely abhorrent. And you can you really can't imagine it in any other context, can you? You can't imagine you know Al Qaeda in 2003 opening up a branded merch store anywhere in the United States. Uh, I just I struggle to think of of a place uh, or an organization with which it has happened, um, but 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 nevertheless, these cards tells do, and 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 you know we also have to understand that that part of the reason these that, that this merch exists is because obviously you know there's a market for it, and there is a cohort of predominantly young men who really like this. They think there's social cachet with it, and so they buy Sinaloa and branded boots. They buy El Chapo hats, like the one I have right here in my hand. Uh, and and it's indicative of a real problem, to say the least. You know, we think of we think of narco culture, you know, with everything that attaches to it, narco corridos and narco gear and things like that, as something that is that is sort of down in the depths of the Sinaloan highlands or places like Barriguato or or you know Jalisco or something like that. 
it's in suburban San Antonio, Texas, uh, and, and 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 there's stores uh, where where you or family members could go and 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 buy this stuff, and that's so incredibly dangerous. Not even the mafia did stuff like this. Yeah. Um. Uh, and so and so we just we need to be aware of it. And if I sound a little bit agitated about it and outraged, uh, it's it's because I am. Uh. You know. You know. The, 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 this stuff should be. Um, positively expunged yeah. from from it's U.S. Disgusting. society to say nothing yeah. of Mexican, and it's it's absolutely disgusting that, that there's that there's no there's no joy in having something like this around, uh, and certainly in um, seeing, although I haven't seen, but in seeing somebody on the street wearing stuff like this. And, and I'll close with this. Sorry to go on an extended rant on it, but God help the dumb 19 year old who buys Sinaloa cartel branded boots and then shows up to the wrong party. Uh, one day with those boots on and somebody takes offense at it. Somebody thinks that, you know, that's not my, that's not my group. That's not my gang. And, and, uh, and, and it kills the guy. You right? think about that. Yeah. It, it absolutely can happen. You know, you know, we see it again in like a gangland situation in the United States, you know, we're wearing the wrong color in the wrong neighborhood can get you popped. Um, uh, you know, the same, the same phenomenon applies here and it's just, uh, it's, it's dangerous stuff. Uh, and it ought to be, an alarm to us to take it seriously. It's terrible, but I will just say I'm almost not surprised. Like I've seen cartels, I've seen narcos be so glamorized uh, through TV, through Netflix, through movies. Yeah. Um, I just watched the Mule, the Mule. I had never watched it with Clint Eastwood. Have you seen I've it? I've never watched it. Is well, it good? Yes, it's okay. it's good. It's just. It's just another show that kind of glamorizes the cartels, makes them look like interesting people, like the good guy. Like, yeah. it's just not surprising to me that people glamorize them so much with like all the shows that are out there. Yeah. Also, a lot of people just view them as like businesses, successful yeah. businessmen. Uh, in fact, that's a libertarian I, view. Yeah. 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 Honestly, and almost. They almost are. I wanted to share this study with you Please. that we were yeah. just talking about. But there was a new study published last week in the journal Science by investigators Rafael Prieto Curiel, Gian Maria Campedelli, and the late Alejandro Hope. Um, but this study uses math and it uses data to try to find solid numbers um, to create a model. But this model found that cartels are one of the top employers in Mexico. Yeah. with 160,000 to 185,000 members and that they need to recruit at least 300 people 350 people per week to make up for all of those that are killed or yeah. imprisoned and this is shocking but i just thought it was interesting cuz obviously i've been reading Yoan Grillo's book and he talks about how in mexico and mexican border cities everybody knows someone that's mixed up in the drug trade, whether that's a cousin, whether that's a parent, whether it's a classmate, a neighbor. And he, you know, he talks to taxi drivers, waitresses. They all know one, know somebody that's involved in the drug trade. That's right. And then in a completely different passage, I, I found this fascinating. But um, he's talking about corruption and then he kind of shifts to the problem with uh, drug law enforcement. And he says this, every time you arrest one trafficker, you are helping his rival. In this way, when the federal police stormed the Zetas safe houses, they were scoring victories for Sinaloans, whether they liked it or not. Arrests do not sub, sub, did not subdue violence, they only inflamed it. So this almost is so frustrating to think about, you know, how the cartels are such a powerful business, yeah. and any efforts almost inflame their efforts. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, let me, let me uh, go back to, um... The study. Uh, uh, yeah, to, to the study, you're right. Uh, the fifth largest employer uh, in Mexico fifth. apparently is is uh, is the cartels. And I forget what the other ones are. It's like it's like it's, uh, it's Pemex, I think, or yeah, or, or Walmart, them. something like that. But um, number five, it's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, it's a big one. That 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 number of necessary was it weekly recruitment, 300 people per week, or was it 300 people per day? 350 per week. Per week, okay. Um, that, that that's a wartime level of replacement. I mean, that is an organization with tremendous attrition. Almost, almost entirely at the lower levels. We have to understand um, that just goes through this churn of people, which is which is one of the reasons we've seen this recent spate of these very horrific uh, forced recruitment videos, right? Where they're oh. where they're kidnapping groups of young men and 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 basically forcing them to to join the cartels through the through this brutalization process that's utterly monstrous, making them kill their best friend and so on. That uh, that sort of breaks them and then and then integrates them into 
and the larger cartel life. That that, that in itself is telling. That that it is it is uh, you know to join a cartel or to be forced into it. Uh, you know the the major parallel in the world stage stage today um, would be in candor Russian recruitment for the war in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Right. You know it's the same sort of we've got to scoop up as much men as we can because we are churning through human life at such a tremendous rate. Uh, and for such an unjust cause too, it's 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 absolutely monstrous. You know, you know, you know. Grillo's point that um, that uh, attacking one cartel helps the other. Uh, I, I think it is indisputably true. But uh, you know, what I would caution against, because this is a point that gets made over and over again in a lot of um, in a lot of places, is this idea that uh, that it is sufficient analysis uh, unto itself. I think there's I think there's ample justification for the view that a lot of what Calderon tried in the first half of his administration, basically from 06 through 09, right. ended up having a destabilizing and amplifying effect upon this the, the, this sort of weird stasis of networks of criminal groups and corruption within Mexico that then got broken apart, and the introduction of dynamism into the system uh, is actually what starts the modern cartel war. So the thinking goes that if you can restore a stasis to the system, that uh, if you can have, let's say we wipe out, uh, I mean, this is a pure hypothetical on my part, but let's say you wipe out Cartel del Noreste, and then you know whatever branch of the setas are left is what gets set up as the king in the north, and then you can have then you can have the Sinaloans and their, their corner and things like that, the old plaza system under Felix Cayer, though, um, uh, that that is preferable to what you have now. I think where the analysis fails is this idea that any of these groups will recede back to the before time. They're not going back. Uh, there's no shoving them back underground. Uh, you're not going to get to this sort of this sort of you know quasi livable stasis that you had, say, you know, clear through the 1990s, where the cartels existed, but at the same time there was this underlay, or they they were an underlay over a veneer of you know formal state authority. Yeah. The Rubicon is crossed, and there's no option but to fight the war yeah. uh, at this point. And I think I think that's where, you know, and I have such tremendous respect for these guys who live in Mexico, who work in Mexico. You know, neither of which I do. Like like you and I, we go uh, and we're and we're present. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, we have we have homes in the United States, which is very safe and very pleasant. And mm-hmm. um, uh, so these folks who do it, but um, the search for a a system answer, I think, is how I would characterize it. Uh, is in the long run not going to work. Um, uh, you have to defeat the main enemy, um, which is which is uh, may in the short run mean introducing more dynamism into right. the system than less. It's a tough tough pill to swallow. Yeah. Well, thank you, Josh. I really want to talk about the border too. Let's do it. We have so much to discuss today, yeah. but I want to shift to the border. Um, some of our breaking news is that the U.S. is making history, but not the good kind. That's um, right. Yeah. We are breaking records right now with the highest illegal crossing attempts ever recorded in a month. And that was the month of August, 304,162. And that's not it. This week, our total migrant encounters surpassed those of last year, last year's fiscal year. So we're not even done. Right. Um, But we are at all time record high levels. Like I said, even with time still left in the fiscal year. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, you know, like what, like what's up with this? I thought that the Biden administration, you know, I thought their sweeping policy reforms had worked. Um, and also this, the reason that I think this is so unusual that they they were at all time highs is because it's still really hot. And usually, historically, we have a dip in illegal immigration in these really hot months, like the month of August. Mm-hmm. And so this is signaling something is very, very wrong, yeah. because if we're seeing these heights right now at the peak of the heat, what's going to happen when it starts to cool off? That usually that tends to go up. It's going to be even worse. I mean, I mean, that, that, that's the thing. The uh, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Despite uh, despite the Biden regime and uh, its handmaidens and media assuring us the, that the open border is not, not actually open. Um, I even saw I even saw a, uh, a news article. I forget where it was sourced from that said uh, the phrase open border is a racist phrase, which I, I guess I guess everything's racist now. Right. Right. So <laughs> tell that to I mean, honestly, though, tell that to the South Texas Mexican-Americans who want the border closed for the sake of their own communities. Um, uh, you know, the, the, we, what we have to understand, this is what I've been saying to, to a lot of individuals, policymakers in particular, uh, is, that, is that when a surge like this happens, it's orchestrated in some way. Mm. You know, this is, not, this is not an organic phenomenon. I mean, yeah. Migration writ large is, you can say it's an organic phenomenon, but the, but the sudden appearance of tens of thousands daily crossing in particular places, moving in groups, uh, you know, traveling on prescribed routes, you know, crossing the river in organized fashion, um, is something that happens because somebody on the Mexican side 
almost certainly connected to the state in some way, has decided that it is opportune to do so. So what we have to think about is what do they want? What's the you know what's the impetus on the Mexican side to to, to cause this to happen? Not just to allow it, but to positively cause it. Uh, I'll give a real world example. Uh, when we had the Haitian migrant crisis, I think it was two years ago in um, uh, in, in in Del Rio, Little Haiti. Yes, right. Where there was like it was like like the like the biggest like the largest Haitian city in the world was briefly under the bridge um, yeah. in on the Texas side in Del Rio, Texas. Uh, you know, you know Todd Benzman's very intrepid reporting because uh, he actually went into Mexico revealed, and nobody in major media picked up on this, which they should have if they were doing their job, but revealed that the reason these Haitians all showed up at the same time was because Mexican officials went through. This is around September fifteenth, which is Mexican mm. Independence Day, and told them that now was the time for them to go ahead and cross into the United States. So there was some kind of an organized effort, uh, uh, you know, you know, we, we can hypothesize, and in fact, I did hypothesize in writing at the time that it was an effort to divert resources from, from other goods, materials, people that were crossing elsewhere. Um, something similar is happening now. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is you have to think of it as a negotiating tactic. Mexico and the Mexican state is applying pressure on Texas and the United States for some purpose. To what purpose is it applied? What do they want? Now, there's no question in my mind, really that the White House and the Biden administration know exactly what they want, uh, and the Mexicans will eventually get it. And the reason that they'll get it is specifically because there is this longstanding policy of the Biden folks just simply capitulating to whatever the Mexicans demand. So they'll eventually get it, but it's very telling to me that they felt that they had to go to the mat uh, with something like this. Yeah. I mean, I can speculate all day as to, as, as to what it is. I mean, my, my personal guess is that they're is that they're trying to force the feds to crack down on Texas by assuming control themselves because they don't like. In fact, they positively fear Texas asserting control of the southern border. Um, but I don't have empirical evidence for that. But that that that's the question that should be asked, and no one in media is asking it. You will no. search in vain in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Texas Tribune, anywhere else, asking the question, not just what does the individual migrant want, which is a well-reported topic, but what does the Mexican state want out of this, which yeah. is the driver of all this? And that's what we have to ask. And that's what they call, or what we've called in the past too, it's like weaponized migration. Bingo. And it's interesting because in response to the crisis that we've been having at the border, the Biden administration has responded in what is a very interesting way and almost, I would like to say unpredictable, but it's so predictable, the the Venezuelan crisis. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to create some sort of federal deterrence to this problem, they're almost encouraging more people and giving more people hope. Because recently, um, the Biden administration extended deportation protection and work permits to almost half a million Venezuelans. Yes whoever arrived here before yeah. July 31st. And this is so interesting because a lot of people are applied, applauding the Biden administration for this. But like, what do you, what kind of consequences do you foresee this having? Because first of all, TPS, this temporary protected status is normally right. something that's extended to people from other countries that are f fleeing like earthquakes or civil wars or like big c catastrophes, right? right? It's not typically extended to people that are just living in a country facing like dire situations, which yes, the Venezuelans are, but this isn't typically extended to people that are just fleeing like general violence or poverty. So what kind of precedent that th this is set, right? Because there's a lot of other people that are fleeing the same kind of circumstances. What about, and what about the other Venezuelans? Like, what if you got here on August 1st? Right. Like, why, why don't you make that cut? They'll get theirs in time. Uh, there's nothing temporary about temporary protected status. I mean, right. that's the thing we have to understand. The, these half million individuals uh, who uh, I assume largely came to the United States illegally uh, or claimed asylum after having come illegally are, uh, let's be let's be very candid, they will be here for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Uh, you know, now that this, this de facto amnesty, let's call it what it is, yep. is extended to this population of half a million. And look, you know, no disparagement of the individual Venezuelan. If I were in Venezuela, I'd want to come to the United States too, of right? Course. But, you know, we're, you know, we have a responsibility to maintain rule of law and regular order in the nation, which we've completely failed to do. We also have a responsibility to maintain control over who joins our political community. It's a basic attribute of nations, and we've absolutely failed to do it. So what happens now is that this is an indiv this is a population of half a million, um, you know, a drop in the bucket out of a 330 million uh, U.S. population. But these things have a tendency to grow. Um, uh, they will now the, the major effect on their individual lives is that they'll be able to work legally. 
really. Uh, that's, the, that's the number one thing. Having done that, they will never be deported. They will either uh, avoid deportation just, just simply because they won't respond to summons or they won't do, you know, they won't respect notices to appear, which is very common. Or there won't be political will on the U.S. side to deport somebody who has been, you know, a like a, like a good worker at a place for eight years and now his TPS status is running out. So we must understand that those individuals are going to be here forever yeah, the uh, for the rest of their lives. lives. And, um, uh, you know, what, what this says about now, now I, I just want to be very clear and explicit. Like I personally, uh, you know, I'm from South Texas, uh, talking with my Bolivian American colleague, um, uh, you know, folks from Latin America and the United States, not a problem for me. But being illegally in the United States is a huge problem. And being illegally in the United States uh, in an uncontrolled migration situation where the federal government rolls over and simply validates what was done previously, to me, uh, and I think to a lot of Americans, that is something where you can see the death of the republic and the end of rule of law heaving into view. And so the extension of, of, this, uh, of, of this, this new status, TPS, um, to these half million Venezuelans, um, uh, we have to understand it as fundamentally a political gesture. And it's a political gesture to yep. two constituencies on the left. One is, of course, um, uh, kind of the, 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 the democratic voting. I mean, we're not partisan here, but just being descriptive, democratic voting uh, Americans of Latin American origin. Many of whom, particularly in the north and in urban cores, are going to see this and respond favorably to it, or at least that's the thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other constituency is is uh, Democratic mayors of large cities mm. who are increasingly pushing back uh, against um, the Biden administration's migration policies, specifically because of what, to what my mind is a policy flash of genius on the point on, on the part of Texas Governor Greg Abbott to bust the migrants to their cities. All right, you know, you think Texas is ungenerous, you think there should yeah. be an open border, well, here you go. Like, here's a fraction of, of, of what we have. A and tiny we, fraction. A tiny fraction. Oh, I mean, what was, um, uh, I think it was Eric Adams, you know, was, was complaining about like oh. having 10,000 people show up and, and that's, I mean, that, that's Wednesday in Del Rio, mm. right? And so, and so, you know, good, good for them. Like, like you can deal with it now. And so there's counter pressure on the White House to, uh, to, to get something done. So I, I think you're going to see a lot more of these, these kind of weird administrative stopgap measures yeah. uh, on it. One thing that I would urge, uh, we did not talk about this when I was talking with the, um, cartel task force members because it was external to kind of the remit of that particular task force. But uh, uh, for any, you know, legislator, congressman listening to this right now, and I know there's a couple of you out there, uh, uh, you know, you know, this is an area where Congress as the legislative body under the Constitution ought to be the one actually making law for the executive branch to be making law in this, and in a whole host of other issues too. I mean, the administrative state writ large is a cancer, but for it to make law in this way with this rapidity is eventually fatal to representative yeah. government in the United States. And we have to, we just, we have to sound that alarm. Yeah, that's yeah. so true. <sighs> well, I want to shift over into Mexico just a little bit because we're not the only ones facing this right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> Mexico's facing it too. Mm -hmm. um, and so something that I found fascinating is I was reading that apparently migrants have been pouring in to, the, well, many parts of Mexico. Sure. But the study I was reading about is the city of Tapachula. Tapachula, yeah. Which is right by um, the Mexican border with Gua Gua Guatemala. Yeah, it's kind of a crossroads, actually. Yeah. Really, yeah. So it's a ton of people just hoping to receive, like, the necessary travel documents to transit through Mexico and into the U.S. But this source um, in Tapachula with an international humanitarian relief organization recently came out and said that they counted over 5,000 people that were waiting in line to be processed outside the offices of the Mexican Commission for Refugee Assistance, mm -hmm. so COMAR in Spanish. Sure. Yeah. The commission has reported a very sharp increase uh, in the asylum requests that they've been getting. Um, just this year, they have gotten over 100,000 yeah. asylum requests. And um, there was this video that came out on social media that was showing a fight outside their offices. This was less than two weeks ago. This was on September 18th. And migrants were fighting and storming their facilities. Yeah. So clearly we're not, you know, we're not the only ones dealing with this. But AMLO's response to that was, we are working together with the United States and taking care of the migrants. We are accompanying them so that there are no violations of their human rights, so they're not kidnapped. And we're seeking information mechanisms so that they can legally have access to the United States. That is what we're doing. So what really? do you what do you think of this? Is he just like washing his hands of the pro from the problem, just trying to 
push them into the U.S.? AMLO, uh, uh, for, the, for the listeners who don't know, it's uh, the, the Mexican president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, uh, goes by AMLO. Uh, he, has, he has a real ideological um, fervor for, for migrants, uh, I, think, I think it's safe to say. Yeah. When, he was, when he was campaigning for the Mexican presidency for the third time in the 2018 campaign, uh, he, he was actually he was in the United States. I don't remember where, where exactly he was. But uh, by the way, Mexican presidential candidates will campaign in the United States yeah. for votes from Mexican nationals in the United States. People and, will see it soon. It's coming. Uh, yeah, they will. They yeah. will. I've, I've seen Morena posters up in Laredo, yeah. uh, Texas, and so it's 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 a real phenomenon, which which also ought to give us some pause. But uh, but he was there, and uh, he was responding at the time to the uh, Trump slogan, Make America Great Again. Uh, this is not a direct quote, but it's a paraphrase. He said, he said, well, if America's great, it's only because of migrants. You know, migrants made America great because mm-hmm. he, he has this very simplistic um, kind of almost mercantile view that, uh, you know, it's it's only this sort of peasant laboring class that, uh, that, that, that gives a nation wealth. And so the United States, in his mind, has attracted this mass of, of essentially unskilled labor and has uh, extracted wealth from them throughout. And so and so you see it again and again. We've talked many times about, you, you see the signs of the Mexico City Airport that uh, congratulate yeah. the migrants, um, you know, um, uh, no estás en México, pero México está en tu corazón. Uh, uh, so Mexico's always in your heart. Um, I never get tired of recalling that because it's just such a bizarre thing to see. You know, if if, uh, if if you would if you would govern your country well, uh, mm. you could be in Mexico, right? And so 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 this the, this ideological kind of prior fixation that AMLO and the and the Morenistas have vis-a-vis migrants prevents them from uh, effectively controlling their own southern border. I mean, and, and, and let's be clear, there's there's two major reasons that they don't. One is one is that they do have this ideological fixation that there is no, in their mind, legitimate moral reason to deny migration to anybody for any reason. There just isn't. A lot of the American left is seized by this concept mm-hmm. as well. There's no yeah. moral reason to say, no, you can't come. Uh, uh, but the other reason that they like it is because they're making tons of money off of it. Right. Because the cartels that traffic everybody and Tapachula, Chapa, which you mentioned, is, is a known major crossroads where these trafficking organizations essentially have standing offices. And once you arrive, uh, I mean, let's assume you're not part of, you're not being trafficked out of Guatemala, which you probably are. But let's say by some miracle you you come from Guatemala or through Guatemala. You cross the border into Chiapas or wherever, right. and and you end up in Tapachula. Tapachula is where you're going to get picked up. You oh, know, yeah. it's it's where you're going to be. You know, like some group's going to you're, you're going to pay your bribe. You're going to or or you're extorted. You're and, not and walking someone. through it on your own. No, you're not walking through it on your yeah. own. You don't have the option of saying no, no. I'm going to do this by myself. Uh, you know, it's like, like like the bellman is definitely carrying your luggage uh, once you went out of the lobby, and so and so that's that that that's where it happens, and that's the other reason that the Mexican state, even though you know, and I have you know, I have no beef with with, with Comar, but uh, but we need to understand that Comar, and then and then uh, is, is that a subset of INM, by the way, uh, the Instituto Nacional Migración? I'm not sure, actually. or is it a separate entity? So 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 INM we know is uh, it's the National Migration Institute, uh, which, which which I I. I Thought I could be wrong about this, so this is a detail of Mexican governance. I actually don't know in full candor, um, but INM itself, uh, which has considerable responsibility for migrants, is is itself a trafficking organization, just like Sedena is, yeah. uh, you know, which is the army uh, in Mexico. Um, uh, and so, if these if these you know Comar uh, employees, let's say, let's be charitable and assume that they're trying to do the right thing by these migrants and really render services, uh, their efforts are rendered null and void by the efforts of their own leadership, um, which which could cut off the flow like that if they chose to. The Mexican army in particular is not incompetent. It is highly competent at what it does, but we must look at what it does to see what its real priorities are. I agree. Well, that's fascinating. Well, since we're shifting towards the topic of AMLO, yeah. I wanted to ask you about his pick to lead Morena. Um, oh, yeah. Mexico, City's, Mexico City's former mayor and the current front runner um, for Mexico City's next president, um, she, we've talked about this a lot, but she's kind of, you know, Claudia. this like and like non-entity, kind of like a puppet, and so a lot of people think that she might actually be worse than Amlo. Uh, she has the same priorities. She still wants to, you know, give help to the vulnerable populations. Mm-hmm. She still wants to work a lot on climate, although she'll probably be harder on climate than Amlo. And then she still is running on like um, rooting out the corruption in Mexico, like a lot of the same stuff. But that's actually not what I want to ask you about. I want to ask you about some pictures that you showed me like yesterday or the day before sure. about her on the campaign trail. Oh, Can Claudia. you share that with... I'll, I'll try to link mm. them actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. For our listeners. Yeah, yeah link, them, link them in the show description for sure. 
Claudia Scheinbaum. Claudia's uh, g- g- parents or grandparents were Eastern European immigrants. One from, I think, Lithuania, the other from Bulgaria. Do you remember? I think parents. It was parents? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, either parents yeah, or grandparents. Parents, yeah. but, uh, but she's she's part of a, um, you know, there's two, there's two historic Jewish communities in Mexico. One is... Um, the Sephardic community, which has been there from mm-hmm. the start, you know, came in the 16th century. Uh, I actually have a lot of Sephardic Jewish ancestors, which sounds very exciting. Except everybody with Norteño blood also has Jewish ancestry. But if you're, if you're, if you're a, a Garza Perez, um, uh, almost all of the Trevinos, um, what's the other names? Uh, that are that are um, Onyate, Cantu. Anyway, they're they're all they, they've all got Sephardic uh, Jewish ancestry. So, if any of you out there listening, look it up. It's extremely interesting. That's one element of of kind of historic Mexican. Jewish Judaism. There's a separate strain of, of Judaism in Mexico that came in the middle of the 20th century for obvious reasons, mostly as refugees uh, or kind of upper class migrants. And they're they're not Sephardic; they're Ashkenazi. So you know, from mm-hmm. from Eastern Europe. And this is this is uh, Claudia Scheinbaum's uh, family origin. So yep. so much more uh, much more recent. It's 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 been very interesting to see uh, how she contends with it. You know, I I don't. Um, I'm going to have to qualify this very heavily because obviously there are major exceptions. One of whom we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, anti-Semitism uh, is is uh, I wouldn't say a huge issue in modern-day Mexico. I mean, it was it was a significant issue back when, like, some of my ancestors were getting executed for it, uh, you know, 400 years ago. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, you know, it's it's not a thing now. What 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 is driving in Mexico is I would say alienation of elites from the common people. Mm-hmm. Claudia Scheinbaum having this the, this combination of being um, manifestly an elite Jewish U.S. educated. She's a scientist. Um, uh, she is this classic kind of disconnected Mexican elite. Mm-hmm. This is all going to get to the pictures, I promise. <laughs> and uh, and so she's been trying to um, uh, basically show her bona fides uh, mm-hmm. on you know saying that she's you and I talked about. It, she says she's as Mexican as oh. mole, more Mexican oh, than mole. Don't remind me. I know, I know. So more Mexican than mole. She's spoken that uh, that Tabasco accent. By yeah. the way, I watched the video and I watched the mama yeah. video and I can I, I can now see what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So she has a fake accent. What she's doing is directly reminiscent of what Hillary Clinton would do. When Hillary Clinton would adopt an Arkansas accent back when she was first lady of Arkansas, yeah, you're and, right. and even in the 1992 campaign, you would hear, and it's it's very it's very interesting because of course as soon as as soon as it was clear that she was going to live in the White House, she completely dropped the Arkansas accent immediately and spoke like she actually speaks, which is a child of um, uh, from Chicago land, isn't she? I think so. I, 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 yeah. I believe so. But anyway, so so her accent changed. Same thing with Barack Obama, like in the brief times when he tried to adopt like a Southside uh, accent as well. It's it's phony, right? And it's fraudulent. Yeah. So, so Claudia has been taking hits, um, uh, hits for being elitist, which she deserves, but also hits for being Jewish, which she does not deserve. Uh, and the signal example is former President uh, Vicente Fox, who is. Oh yeah. Did you did you see his his comment? Yeah, uh, yeah. He said. I think um, we talked about it on the podcast. No, no, this is a new one. This is oh, the last it's week. A new one? It's a new one. Um, uh, he said, uh, uh, "As uh, this is on Twitter, of course, which is like the the portal of evil of all human humankind." Uh, he said, um, uh, "As uh, una extraña y un judía tal vez." She's a she's a foreigner and a Jew at the same time, which is pretty ugly stuff. Pretty ugly stuff. This is former president of Mexico, uh, and so and so to respond not directly to that, but implicitly to that, she has taken to wearing um, a large crucifix uh, in her public events, like around her neck, and uh, she's even been. I think it was in her visit to. Which Oaxaca. she didn't wear before. Which, of course not. I mean, I mean, there's no. Why would she? It's it's it's. Uh, and and um, uh, I, I believe she went on a campaign trip to Oaxaca. I think this is where this is from. But she's got this very beautiful like traditional dress, and it's got the. Yes. Uh, Virgen de Guadalupe, the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, on like on the on the skirt, right? Yes. It's the large Virgin of Guadalupe. So, for those listeners who don't know, Catholic symbol, um, you know, it's the mother of God, as as, as who appeared to uh, San Juan Diego. Anyway, uh, n- not things you know, crucifix and, and and Our Lady of Guadalupe are not things that you expect to see on like like your median Jewish faithful uh, person out there. Mm-hmm. And and you know, I have to say. Um, much as I think she is uh, presenting herself kind of as familiar sort of sort of um, uh, faux populist phony, basically, which is absolutely what she's doing with the accent and everything else. When I see her uh, dressing as as uh, literally dressing as a um, uh, you know like a like an ordinary you know uh, like a, like a Mexican peasant of median piety um, uh, out there, I, I kind of feel sorry for. Her. Yeah. Honestly, because you know it's it's uh, it's 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 an abasement of sorts, but it's an abasement that reveals just how much she wants power. 
how badly she wants to be president. It's and sad. it's almost a disqualifier. The fact she had to like post pictures of her birth certificate and that she needs to make all these statements, it's sad and, and it, honestly it's embarrassing. Yeah, it is, and 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 look, she, you know, she's uh, there are plenty of guilty parties uh, in this one, and certainly, you know, people like uh, you know former President Fox, uh, who you know accuse her of being, and this is not my quote, this is hers, is his, uh, like a foreigner and a Jew are uh, a disgrace, and it's an important thing to say, and you know, you should oh. you should you know contend on the issues, but um, she is interestingly enough, um, uh, her team right now, uh, I guess we'll make a little bit of news, although this is the most minor news imaginable on this podcast. Her team is contacting American conservative organizations right now and, yeah. and, and requesting meetings, uh, with them. Um, so, so, so Claudia, if you're out there, uh, you're invited to the hard country. Uh, <laughs> uh I don't know if you like the conversation. Um, uh, but, uh, it's, it's interesting to me that she feels like the, there needs to be this outreach. And one of the things that, uh, at least I'm interpreting, uh, from it is that at least in some places in Morena, certainly not with AMLO himself, the uh, the U.S. conservative critique of Mexico, a critique that we pioneered on the show, um, and with our work at the foundation, is 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 seeping into the consciousness of those who will be in charge of the Mexican executive in the next term. And uh, candidly, I think it's a good thing that they know. They need to know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have some interesting updates next time we film or in a couple we'll times. Yep. We shall see. But um, we've touched on a lot of things. I want to ask you about one more thing. I want to ask you about this blog post. Uh, I printed it out for oh, you. Oh, sure. Yes. But it was found on the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, it's from a Will Freeman via the Dallas Morning News. It's a Dallas Morning News column, actually. Yeah, yeah right. so it's fascinating. Actually, it's relevant because we just had the GOP presidential debate last night, which we both watched. But the, yeah. art the article talks about the first debate, and it mentions all of the presidential hopefuls and how the one thing that seems to bring this uh, you know, group of very divided people together se seems to be this dangerous, disastrous idea of employing the military to fight cartels, right? Right. Um, so it's it's interesting. He touches on a lot of different things, but the author also talks about the Monroe Doctrine, which we've also talked about on one of our podcast episodes. But he says yes. that how if it were to ever be tried again, it would only push Latin America further away from the U.S. and into China's arms because there's nothing that us Latin Americans hate more than heavy-handed interventionism from the United States. Okay, but wait, I have to inter I have to interject here. I mean, you you are a Bolivian who grew up in Bolivian schools. Is that true? No. <laughs> oh, it's not. Okay, please. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. I think we've talked about this too before, but like Bolivia is very friendly towards the U.S. Yeah. Bolivians love the U.S. Bolivia has no history of U.S. intervention either. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, right, yeah. So it's a little bit different, but uh, we. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but. Yeah. We wish they would help because our country's a disaster <laughs> right, right now. Right, yeah. And it has been for the past, what, 16 years? Like, people are really suffering. We have, you know, we've had a dic we had a dictator for 14 years. Did you see um, the news article that I texted you about uh, that, that exact dictator, Evo Morales? I is haven't running. looked at it yet. It's he's been he's a running for morning. president again. Oh, my God. Yeah. Don't. Oh. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> That's a whole podcast. Um, yes. But yeah, basically, there's a lot to unpack in the article. I just wanted to, you to maybe walk our listeners to anything that I just missed and give us your thoughts. Yeah, you know, um, uh, l l let me say at the outset, you know, you're talking about the Bolivians wishing, Bolivians who wish that the United States would would intervene more. Um, uh, several of our contacts in um, in Mexico uh, across the spectrum, and you know who some of these people are, yeah. although I won't put them on the spot because I don't have their permission to say their names uh, here on the podcast, uh, have said to us in private that they wish the United States would would be more interventionist. And it's something that, that uh, yeah. there's not like public permission to say, uh, but there's obviously a sentiment, and I'm thinking specifically of a journalist, somebody in the business community, and somebody in the intellectual community um, uh, who are, uh, I would say maybe only one of them might have been considered conservative. Um, uh, you know, have, have said to us directly that, uh, oh man, if only the United States would get more involved. And so there's this belief that the United States can save them from themselves. So there's this right. desire for a pro-consular policy vis-a-vis -vis Mexico, which, which is an absolute non-starter in public conversation. 
So I think when you when you analyze sentiment and action in Latin America in particular, uh, you have to be aware that there's these multiple levels of, of, of sentiment. There's what's on the surface, there's what's actually happening, and there's what you know, like maybe the actual real desires are. And so there's and, and, and that's not because Latin America is any deeper or more unique. I mean that 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 sort of analysis has to happen in the United States too. Um, uh, so 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 this article. Uh, that originally ran in the Dallas Morning News by Will Freeman. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know Will Freeman. I'm not familiar with his Me work. Either. So so so, the, the, so what follows is not a personal critique because uh, he, he may be the best LATAM analyst in the world for all I know. Um, uh, this particular article, though, I thought was really interesting because it illuminated um, uh, what, what what I would say is is the surface level critique of, of American policy toward Latin America. Do you mind if I read the closing passage yeah, from, uh, from from his piece? So, so again, you can find this on the website of the Council of Foreign Relations or go to Dallas Morning News. Um, uh, and the title is, uh, The GOP's posturing will push Latin America into China's arms. So here's his final two paragraphs. The next president of the United States can and should forge deeper ties with Latin America. Only through cooperation will the United States and its neighbors find solutions to the hemispheric challenges of transnational organized crime, fentanyl trafficking, and unprecedented migration and climate change. But it requires bringing something to the table, as the Biden administration, to its credit, plainly recognizes the days of unilateral domination are over, given the distrust they sowed between the United States and Latin America. Good riddance. So then he continues, policymakers in the next administration should draw on a historical model different from Monroe's. They should draw on Franklin Delano Roosevelt's good neighbor policy, which built up goodwill in the region by pledging respect for Latin American sovereignty. So that's his that's his that's his historical template. FDR's good neighbor policy. It's amazing to me to read stuff like this um, because, the, the, as in so many cases, theory and empirical outcomes just collide mm-hmm. head head on with each other. And one of the virtues I think of ideological conservatism, you know, rooted in the Burkean tradition, is that is that we we pay attention to empiricism, and we acquiesce to it when we must. This is a prime example. The good neighbor policy uh, under FDR, which still, by the way, kept the Western Hemisphere under American strategic domination, has been massively extended in the past three decades. When you look at at true uh, U.S. assertion of prerogative and dominance in the Western Hemisphere, you're really talking about um, you know kind of this era that's bookended by mm-hmm. the 1989 invasion of Panama. And then the 1994 occupation of, uh, of 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 Haiti, and then and then it kind of ends. So we've had a generation plus at this point in which Latin America, um, almost for the first time since independence from from the Spanish, you know, which unfolds from basically 1810 through through the early 1820s, uh, uh, has has had true strategic autonomy. Like, 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 really, it's 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 really just about the first time. I mean, they kind of had it in the 19th century, but there was a lot of internal stuff going on, and so and so with the Monroe Doctrine and then with American strategic primacy, uh, Latin America was not truly a strategically autonomous region. There was no sense in which you know what we see now, which is the Chinese and the Russians marching troops with the Sokolo, uh, which did happen on Mexican Independence Day just a couple of weeks ago. We should talk about that briefly. Um, uh, or with Chinese investment in the Panama Canal, or with, uh, with 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 PRC buying of Brazilian commodities, you know, over and over and over with Iranian vessels making port visits, all of this would have been unthinkable in the previous era. Yeah. So the argument that we haven't had a good neighbor policy, uh, I would say we've had too much of it. Uh, you know, you know, the the, the era of, of of like pan regional Latin American strategic autonomy has been exceptionally bad for the United States. Right. And I would argue it's been bad for the region too, um, uh, in ways that you know may not be ideologically satisfying uh, to a lot of folks within it, but I think are unquestionably true. And so uh, you know, you know, th- this is, uh, and again, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know the author, and so so. This is not this is not a personal attack on him, um, uh, but 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 the analysis here I think represents sort of the almost like the dead hand of the ossified consensus mm-hmm. that that has attached itself to policy circles and to academia circles for far too long and has resulted directly in the crisis that we have now, mm-hmm. in which in which the Mexican state breakdown is just one facet of a broader regional crisis that is going to require the United States to re-engage in the Western Hemisphere in ways it has not 
in almost a century. I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. If we regard the US as having two major strategic fronts for the past generation, one in Europe, broadly speaking, and I'll include the Middle East in that. So, you know, from a from a military combatant command perspective, UCOM and CENTCOM, and then you have, you know, Pacific Command or Indo PACOM now they call it. So Indo Pacific Command, which is a nice branding exercise. Uh, well, uh, Southcom is 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 now going to come into play too, and there's no strategy. Uh, there's really no forces. There's really no funding for it. Uh, I think we're going to find that there's a third front, strategic front, opening up for the United States sooner than we think, specifically because this advice here has actually been followed, yeah. and the results speak for themselves. Will you share with our listeners? We'll, you we'll kind of touched on it, but what happened at the Socalo for Mexican Independence Day? Yes, uh, yeah. you shared it in your testimony. Thanks for thanks for reminding me. Uh, so 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 Mexican Independence Day. Uh, you can find this on YouTube. We should link to it uh, yeah. in the show description. Uh, but you can find it on YouTube. It's, uh, th- th- there was a um, there was a, a march in review. Uh, through the Socolo, and so the Socolo is the main square uh, in Mexico City. It's 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 actually where the old Aztec uh, main square is. Beautiful, fascinating. It's yeah. an amazing place. Uh, so giant giant plaza, um, uh, and the Mexicans uh, invited foreign military contingents to come and march through, and and, and most of them were contingents that you would expect. Um, you know, other Latin American militaries. I think the South Koreans were there, which is a little bit odd, but um, but they made a point. And this is no question. This was done uh, because the president of Mexico wanted it done. They made a point of inviting Russian and Chinese troops mm. to march to the Sokolo. So we had this very startling spectacle of, of the Preobrazhensky uh, guards, which is a very storied Russian. Uh, now it's a ceremonial unit, but it's got a very storied uh, history in, in uh, kind of Russian arms. Marching through the Sokolo as the Mexican president salutes them. And then following close on their heels is uh, is the People's Liberation Army, uh, also marching through in ceremonial garb, you know, and, and they're each holding their national flags, you know, coming up, also mm-hmm. being saluted by the president of Mexico. And we have to understand this is a message to the United States. And Mexico, I said this in my testimony, Mexico, which is a nation dependent upon the United States for its economic life, is playing a very dangerous game by choosing to have PRC and Russian infantry march through uh, the Sokolo, even for ceremonial purposes. Uh, A profoundly foolish act uh, by AMLO that if we had a State Department uh, or a White House that was interested in defending American prerogatives uh, vis-a-vis our neighbors in particular, um, might have ended up being something other than it was, which is uh, uh, candidly something that only people like you and I notice. Yeah, and we'll make sure to link that. We will. But uh, before we wrap, which we are a little bit over our time. But before we wrap, I want to share with our listeners why I won't be here next week or in the next month. Yes, yes. Um, We will make sure to get our listeners some sort of viewing material. We won't leave them high and dry. We may do do another Zoom episode. Yeah, Uh, we may do a Zoom, or maybe for the first time we'll have you with a a guest speaker. Okay. Um, But... I won't be here in the next month because, as you know, I'm doing a program with Fundación Dicenso, which is this amazing think tank, much like us at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, that works on, you know, freedom and national sovereignty and life and family. And um, they also conduct analysis. They do research. They educate lawmakers and the public. So it's very similar to the work that we do here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um Unlike TPPF, though, they're located in Madrid. And so I will be doing this program with them that basically takes people, takes individuals, and puts them in this training program to, to equip them on all of these on all of these foundational things, right? And so I will be leaving. I will be, you know, spending some time in DC, in Madrid, um, in Rome, Budapest, uh, Warsaw, which it's, I'm very excited about. It's quite but, a fellowship, yeah. Yeah, so I won't be here with you in the studio. Maybe we'll do a Zoom and, and you know talk about that while I'm there, or you'll have a guest speaker. But I'm so excited to come back and share with you and with you know our listeners what I learned. And I'm even more excited to come back to TBPF and apply everything that I've learned to well, our work here. Uh, well, well, congratulations on securing the fellowship. It's a well-deserved uh, recognition you. for you Thanks and your you work. Uh, well, no, uh, no. Um, but uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm eager to hear what you learn. And uh, you're going to make it to Spain before me. Yes, uh, I will. So you'll have, to, uh, you'll have to tell us how it is. Uh, and the most important thing, of course, in visiting any country is tell us how the food is. Uh, so I know it'll be amazing. It will be. It will be. But uh, safe travels. Thank you, and John. And we'll see you guys later.